The looting of Africa has been going on for a long time. Obviously, you've got the diamond trade, and before that, you could even say the slave trade. Yeah. So what's changing now? You go back to Rhodes and King Leopold carving up Africa in the late 19th century, and exactly as you say, further back to, to slavery. To, in one way or another, Africa has been pillaged for centuries. What's changed now, I think, is that corrupt interests are becoming detached from states. So with Cecil Rhodes, he was operating under the British flag and he would take liberties and he would sign treaties without really letting Lon to London what he was up to. But by and large, these were kind of state interests that were at play and they would use natural resources, yes, to enrich themselves, but also to advance kind of national strategies. And in the Cold War, it was the same thing. The insanity of the Cold War in Angola was driven to an extent by Soviet and US rivalry. Now, I think what's emerging since the turn of the century, turn of the millennium, is something that's much more globalised and detached from nation states. So, for instance, in the, a, lot, a lot of the book is the story of this remarkable thing called the Queensway Group, which is this network of companies that spreads out from a headquarters in Hong Kong. And one uh, particular middleman, this, this guy with seven names, called Sam Park, and the network that he's put together. And you can look at that superficially as a kind of arm of the Chinese government. It's only that t from, from one aspect. It's also just a cog in several global commodity markets. It's also um, an ally of various repressive African leaders. And it's also a way in to some of these countries for big Western companies, BP and Glencore do business with this. Why is Africa such a target for this? Because it's the weakest states. If a large part of your government income is from natural resources, you're inherently not responsive to the, to the broader good. In Nigeria, 70% of the government's income comes from selling oil, and 4% comes from taxing the people. There is no hold of the average person on power, because power flows from oil money, not from taxing the people. Backhanders and bribes are culturally accepted in a lot of countries. How damaging are these for international business? Culturally accepted is always a slightly dangerous term, I think. It becomes a racist argument. It's almost as though there's something sort of genetically inherent in African... Well, it probably happens in the UK as well. It does happen in the UK, but, it, but this argument can be, can be totally distorted. I remember a good example of this in eastern Congo, a place that's been at war for, for 20 years, whose war has been funded in part by those huge mineral resources that flow out from eastern Congo into our mobile phones. And I remember driving through there and being... Uh, stopped at a checkpoint, going for a leak at the side of the road, and then having a soldier with an AK run over, waving his gun, and telling me um, it is absolutely forbidden to piss in this park because it will um, it will hurt the the gorillas. But what he was doing was exactly what the president is doing. He's capturing a little piece of territory. In his case, it's a crossroads in the um, in one of the nat natural parks, and uh, he's extorting rent from it. And the president is doing the same thing with the in entire nation, politically capturing the, the huge copper reserves and the huge um, natural resources of the East and tithing them effectively and just and extracting rent from them. So once the state at the top has become a machine for extracting rent, that can happen at every layer all the way down. So yes, in a way, I suppose it becomes culturally acceptable, but it's also just the licence that's afforded to every level of someone who holds authority if that's how it is at the top. Well, this corruption, what sort of knock-on effect does it have at a grassroots level? It's almost immeasurable. Take Nigeria, I lived there for two years, and I go back often. The sound of everyday life in, in Lagos and in the big cities is this crazy rattle and hum of thousands and thousands of generators working. And the reason there are all those generators working is because the biggest energy exporter in Africa produces about as much electricity for its own people as North Korea. If you turned on the entire national grid in Nigeria, it would run about one toaster for every 40 Nigerians. This is the country that's pumping out two million barrels of oil a day, has the seventh biggest reserve of gas in the world. Why is that? Partly that's to do with the distortions of an oil economy, and partly it's to do with simple theft. Finally, do you think there are any green shoots? Is Africa on the right track to making them better? Or is this so integrated into the business and culture that really... This is just the way forward now. Hard to generalise with Africa. That's why the, I thought the whole narrative of Africa rising and annoyed me a lot because, I mean, I've tried in the book to avoid generalising uh, by suggesting, you know, the whole of Africa is going to hell in a handbasket, which it obviously isn't. Similarly, the idea that the entire continent is universally rising as one is, is nonsense. The debate that's most worthwhile, I think, for outsiders 
is not to try to come to a decision on whether a continent of 900 million people in sub-Saharan Africa is on the up or on the down, or indeed whether they're kind of just putting their our aid money in their pocket and all this nonsense. It's to try to maybe put our own house in order a bit more. Every single one of the, the, the extraordinary kind of couldn't make it up corruption scams and scandals that I've tried to piece together in the book without exception involves uh, an offshore tax haven, a secrecy jurisdiction, where you can put together a company and you can hide the fact that you own it. If you're an oil minister of an African country, or if you're a middleman, or if you're a Westerner or a Chinese guy wanting to funnel a bribe or receive a kickback, that's how you do it. The majority of those places, the head of, this, the head of state is the Queen, they're either in the Caribbean or in the English Channel. There is already pressure starting for this. It would be incredibly straightforward to have a public registry of beneficial ownership of all the people who own all those companies in those places. That's something that um, requires a little bit of political will. A few people have been, a few far more erudite people than me have been pushing for that um, for several years. That, far more than any amount of aid or even trade preferences, I think, would be a great fillip in, in, in the West's relationship with some of these most troubled African states. And it's something that is within our gift, rather than going back to the old ways of lecturing um, African leaders on how to run their countries. <laughs>